I have a thought for you this morning that uh, you may not have considered before, and that is that pastors should be disruptive. Pastors who preach the gospel of grace and accurately teach the word are dangerous men. They will disrupt your worldly thinking and cause great damage to your viewpoint of humanity. And they should. If you're exposed to their teaching for any period of time, you'll experience a shift in your perception of the world. And hopefully, their teaching will fundamentally shake the foundations of your view of reality and ethical perception of life. And if you come to understand their message, the result will be a radical new way of thinking built on the foundation of God and His Word. And we have Jesus to thank for these deceptive men. Those who support these teachers, like our pastor, through prayer, encouragement, and financial support, are all accomplices to the disruptive activities and will be appropriately rewarded by God, both in time and eternity. This idea of disruption is what I want to bring to your attention this morning. I mean, our lives are filled with disruption. Just a few days ago, many of our lives were disrupted by a sudden change in the weather. Just in the past couple of years, our lives were disrupted by shutdowns, scarcity of store products, disrupting our buying habits. And gas prices have disrupted our travel plans by more than doubling. Our country has been filled with disruption since its beginning. We've had a civil war that divided and disrupted the country, a great financial depression that disrupted the lives of people not only here in the U.S., but around the world. We were disrupted by two world wars and many others. Natural disasters have continued to disrupt our lives. Throughout the years, we've had tornadoes, hurricanes, earthquakes, floods. I can go on. But the point is this. Our lives are filled with disruptions. And every time a disruption occurs, I can guarantee you that each of us had places to go, people to see, and things to do. But disruptions have been occurring since the beginning of time. The Bible itself is filled with descriptions of times like this, of places and people whose lives were impacted by disruption. In Genesis 3, it describes the choice made by one man and one woman that disrupted the entire planet and all of history to follow. Then, because of their actions, God disrupted and threw out Adam and Eve from the Garden of Eden after they'd sinned. And the disruptions don't stop there. He quarantined Noah and his family in the ark and, this, and then disrupted the entire world with a universal flood. Then he confused the languages of those building the Tower of Babel, disrupting their activity and scattering them geographically in Genesis 11. And then jumping over to the book of Exodus, we find that he disrupted Egypt by sending severe plagues that destroyed the nation, and afterward, he disrupted his own people by expelling them out of the land to begin a great exodus. But you might be saying, Don, this is the Christmas season. What about those cute holiday stories we were expecting, where we might find Mary and the baby Jesus, angels and shepherds, little lambs and drummer boys? Well, okay, maybe not drummer boys. These are wonderful Christmas stories. Don, are you going to focus on disruption on the Sunday before Christmas? Yes, I am. Because if you didn't notice, the Christmas story is full of disruptions. And my fear is that too many of us have heard the Christmas story so many times that we tune out by saying, eh, I already know how this story ends. And if you grew up in church or been involved in one for a while, I'm sure you're well aware of a variety of Christmas messages that you can expect during this season. But I'm hoping this morning you'll consider that hearing these stories over and over is not a bad thing. And then realize 
that the entire Christmas story was a disruption into not only the lives of a group of shepherds, a young unwed girl, a man who had just barely asked the girl to be his wife, but a disruption of the entire world. We find in the Christmas story God's greatest disruption up to that point in world history. He sent his son into the world, into Satan's hostile kingdom of darkness, to be the light of the world and to provide salvation to those enslaved in sin. Now, you may be one of those people, like me, who says, but I don't like my life to be disrupted. Well, whether you realize it or not, no one is better at disrupting our lives than the Lord we serve. Think for a moment. Can you identify times when God disrupted your plans, your dreams, your hopes, your health, your family? Christmas is one week away, and we use that date as a time to celebrate and as a reminder when God disrupted the timeline of mankind. Remember, every person mentioned in the events surrounding the birth of our Savior was disrupted. Let's start in chapter 1, verse 26. The scripture says, in the sixth month, hold on right there, in the sixth month of what? Well, it says, uh, this was the sixth month of Elizabeth's pregnancy. Now, you may know that Elizabeth was Mary's cousin, and with her husband, Zacharias, they had been unable to have kids. I mean, they were not only unable to have children up to that point, but the Bible tells us that Elizabeth was past childbearing years. You need to also understand that these were good people. We are told up front that Zacharias and Elizabeth were both righteous in the sight of God, walking blamelessly in all the commandments and requirements of the Lord. That's a testimony I wish could be said of me. The fact that this godly couple had no children is an important detail because in those days, being barren was considered a curse and probably the result of some sin the person had committed. With that example in mind, it's noteworthy to any of us who've had our long-term prayers unanswered that we might be feeling that it's our fault that God is not answering our prayer. Remember that God's timing in answering your prayer is often far less about you and far more about God and his plans in answering your request. In Luke, we continue in verse 13, he tells us that while Zacharias was taking his turn, ministering before the Lord in the temple, that the angel Gabriel appeared to him announcing, for your petition has been heard and your wife Elizabeth will bear you a son and you will give him the name John. Now, having an angel appear and that appear before you and that same angel speaking, I would say qualifies for a disruption. Now, I'm not sure how many times in the past Zacharias had been chosen for this duty serving in the temple, but I have a strong suspicion that appearing angels were not in the standard operating procedure for temple service. And I'm sorry to say that Zechariah's response to this angelic announcement is much like my, what my response would be when God answered our prayers in ways we didn't expect. It is in Zechariah's reaction that we come to understand how agonizing his petition must have been. I mean, he and Elizabeth had probably been praying so long and so hard that they were not only past childbearing years, but also past expecting an answer. Zacharias replied to Gabriel, How shall I know this for certain? For I am an old man, and my wife is advanced in years. That sounds like a reasonable question. And I always used to wonder why Zacharias was rebuked for it and struck so he couldn't speak until the child was born. Aren't we like this? We pray about something for a long time, and then God answers our prayer, and our response is, Oh, I, I wasn't expecting that. So Zacharias said, I want some proof. And God said, okay, you won't be able to talk for nine months. How about that? 
Well, here's one thing that I think is so subtle, you may miss it. When his, in verse 23, when his time of service was completed, he returned home. I mean, the man had just been visited by an angel, spoken to by an angel, struck mute by an angel, and then he completed his service in the temple. That, I, I'm not sure how I would respond after a disruption like that. But I can guarantee you that my mind would probably not be on my work. So Zacharias leaves the temple, and God disrupts the lives of this older couple when his wife Elizabeth becomes pregnant. So let's go back to verse 26. Remember, it's been six months since her cousin's husband has been able to talk. And it says, in the sixth month, God sent the angel Gabriel to Nazareth a town in Galilee, to a virgin pledged to be married to a man named Joseph, a descendant, a descendant of David. The virgin's name was Mary. You know this story, right? The angel went to her and said, Greetings, you who are highly favored. The Lord is with you. Mary was greatly troubled at his words and wondered what kind of greeting this might be. I don't blame her. But the angel said to her, Do not be afraid, Mary, for you have found favor with God. Take note, this is a disruption. And behold, you will conceive and give birth to a son, and you are to call him Jesus. In verse 32 it says, He will be great and will be called the Son of the Most High. The Lord God will give him the throne of his father David, and he will reign over Jacob's descendants forever. His kingdom will never end. Think about it for a moment. Mary is already engaged to be married to Joseph. This would mean that plans are probably already being made for the wedding and their life following the ceremony. Now, contrary to the practice of many other cultures in which the bride's father would pay the groom's family a dowry, in Jewish culture... The groom's father prayed, paid what's called a bride price to the bride's family in order to negotiate the betrothal. In essence, purchase the bride. And back in that day, once Joseph and Mary had completing the wedding ceremony, they would likely move into an extension of Joseph's family's home, and this newlywed couple would start becoming a part of the town life in Nazareth. Now, let's go back to this angelic ma message. Unlike Zachari uh, Zacharias, we, are told about, we aren't told about any unanswered prayer in Mary's life. This is not only a surprise visit, but it certainly wasn't based on a prayer request. And such a different response from the angel to Mary, Mary compared to the response to Zachariah, because Mary asked something very similar when she said, how can this be since I am a virgin? She was only given assurance. Thinking about Mary at this moment, it shouldn't be any surprise that she was greatly troubled at his words and wondered what kind of greeting this might be. I mean, this was no, hey, Mary, mazel tov. And then in verse 35, the angel continued, the Holy Spirit will come on you and the, most pow and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. So the Holy One to be born will be called the Son of God. Even Elizabeth, your relative, is going to have a child in her old age, and she who was said to be unable to conceive is in her sixth month. For no word from God will ever fail. Isn't that one of the best things to be assured of? That no word from God will ever fail. Mary's response is a testimony to all of us of her total faith in her Creator. She said, I am the Lord's servant. May your word to me be fulfilled. And then the angel left her. That's what happens to people who God empowers to do something great for his kingdom. The Holy Spirit will come upon you, and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. So the Holy One to be born will be called the Son of God. And note that the angel is very specific when identifying the father of this child. He's not the son of Joseph. He's the son of God. 
When God disrupts our lives, God's, God disrupts our lives to give us a better one. And for Mary, it was going to be a life of constant trusting and sub- submission to the will of God. You don't have to be really sharp to, be, to, being a, to try and come up with a list of all the things she was going to face in the next few months. But from her perspective, it was, I serve God, that's my job, that's what I'll do. Now let's turn to Joseph for a moment. Over in the book of Matthew 1.18, it fills us, up, fills us in on what's happening across town. Matthew tells us, this is how the birth of Jesus the Messiah came about. His mother Mary was pledged to be married to Joseph, but before they came together, she was found to be pregnant through the Holy Spirit. Because Joseph, her husband, was faithful to the law and yet did not want to expose her to public disgrace, he had in mind to divorce her quietly. Here's another disruption in case you missed it. Continuing in verse 20, but after he had considered this, meaning divorcing Mary quietly, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream and said, Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to take Mary home as your wife because what is conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. She will give birth to a son and you are to give him the name Jesus because he will save his people from their sin. And then jumping down to verse 24, when Joseph woke up, he did what the angel of the Lord had commanded him and took Mary home as his wife. Now, Joseph didn't exactly have the same angelic shock that Mary and Zacharias had. I mean, his angelic encounter was in a dream. And I don't know about you, but I've had some pretty wild dreams in my life, and thankfully I didn't act on them. I mean, sometimes it was about jumping off a building because I thought I could fly or possibly being chased by dinosaurs. But Darlene tells the story of the time she dreamed about some unpaid bill, and it worried her so much and caused her so much anxiety that she woke, it woke her up. She laid there in bed for about an hour trying to figure out how she was going to pay the bill. And finally, once she was satisfied that she had a plan, she was able to go back to sleep. The only problem was, was that when she woke up the next morning and was ready to put her plan in place, she found out that the bill had already been paid. Well, and like Darlene, Joseph's dream was real enough for him to take action the moment he woke up. But unlike Darlene's dream, it was a real disruption that required life-altering decisions and immediate disruption to take place. Not later, but now. Now let's move on from Joseph's house and head out of town into the hills nearby. It's here we find a group of folks called shepherds. We don't know what their name was or how many there were. There are conflicting articles about their social status, but it's clear that God saw them as important. Back to Luke, now in chapter 2, we read, And there were shepherds living out in the fields nearby, keeping watch over their flocks at night. An angel of the Lord appeared to them, and the glory of the Lord shone round about them, and they were terrified. But the angel said to them, Do not be afraid. I bring you good news that will cause great joy for all people. Today in the town of David, a Savior has been born to you. He is the Messiah, the Lord. This will be a sign to you. You will find a baby wrapped in clothes and lying in a manger. Suddenly, a great company of the heavenly hosts appeared with the angel, praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest heaven, and on earth peace to those whom his favor rests. When the angel had left them and gone into heaven, the shepherds said to one another, Let's go to Bethlehem and see this thing that has happened, which the Lord has told us about. So they hurried off and found Mary and Joseph and the baby who was lying in a manger. When they had seen him, they spread the word concerning what had been told them about this child. And all who heard it were amazed at what the shepherds said to them. But Mary treasured these things and pondered them in her heart. Now the shepherds returned glorifying God and for all the things that they had heard and seen, which were just as they had been told. 
Now, in case you didn't notice, this section is filled with disruptions. First one. And there were shepherds living out in the fields nearby, keeping watch, watch over their flocks at night, and an angel of the Lord appeared to them. As with Zacharias, Mary, and Joseph, we should understand that appearances of angels was not a common occurrence in the lives, and probably not in the lives of many folks around the town. Next we read, So they, the shepherds, hurried off and found Mary and Joseph and the baby who was lying in the manger. So picture this. Ladies, here is Mary who has just given birth. Joseph, who for the first time in his life has received an intense introduction to obstetrics and neonatal care. Both are situated in a room possibly filled with some animals, and both are recovering from an experience that neither were necessarily prepared for. Then, suddenly, to have a bunch, and I use the technical term bunch because scriptures doesn't tell us how many, but definitely more than one, a bunch of shepherds come into the room to see the newborn baby. Now, I'm the proud father of four children. And as I often say when asked, I have four children, all boys except for three girls. And I can speak, I can't speak for you, but I would say I wouldn't be too happy if the hospital had permitted a crowd of strangers into our room after that experience. And I can guarantee you that Darlene would have feelings about something like that. But the disruptions don't stop there. Next we read, When they had seen him, meaning the baby Jesus, they spread the word concerning what had been told them about this child. Now, we have these shepherds running around, disrupting the town. Maybe the local folk were asleep in their beds. Maybe they were starting their morning chores. But I'm guessing that it wasn't the norm to have a bunch of shepherds running around through the town making such a commotion. And finally, from this section, we read, And all who heard it were amazed at what the shepherds said to them. So look at this. We have these town folks who had plans for the day. You know, people to see, places to go, things to do. Well, those plans have been disrupted by what they heard. And I'll guess that what they heard became the talk of the town for the rest of the day, the rest of the week, and thankfully, for over 2,000 years since. Think about this. When God disrupts your life, how you respond is very important. For Zacharias, he was left speechless. For Mary, she offered praise to God. For Joseph, he took immediate action. And for the shepherds, they couldn't keep their mouths shut and told the whole world around them. When you accept the sacrifice for your sins, which is provided by the death of your Savior on the cross, remember, participation is not without risk. Participation is not without disruptions. When God's divine plan intersects with your human will, the result can be disruptive. So how does one find faith when our happiness appears to be stolen? When the spouse cheats, when the child dies, when the employment is lost, when your health fails. When disruptions like these happen in your life, turn to Psalm 37, which reminds us that no matter what the disruptions that come along, the steps of man are established by the Lord, and he delights in his way. When he falls, he will not be hurled down because the Lord is the one who holds his hand. I have been young and now I am old, yet I have not seen the righteous forsaken or his descendants begging for bread. Faith to go on comes from trusting God's character. What happens to the life of a person who fears God will often be painful, confusing, and sometimes angering. Sometimes God will speak his plans into our hearts if we still ourselves long enough so that we can hear him. Whether he gives a dream doesn't matter. We know that God works out everything for the good for those who love him and are called according to his purpose. You will have to endure pain. You will have your plans changed. You will have to forgive. But you will 
be in God's will and participating in the plan of salvation. Remember, when God's plan intersects with your plans, the disruption to your life can be dramatic and traumatic, as well as was the case for Zacharias, Mary, Joseph, and the shepherds. One last thing, Philippians chapter 2, Paul tells us, Have this mind among yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus, who, though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself by taking the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of men, and being found in human form, he humbled himself by by becoming obedient to the point of death on a cross. Therefore God has highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name that is above every name, so that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Amen. I hope this Christmas season is not only one of celebration for you and your family, but a recognition that we serve a God who will use disruption to make you a child of faith, willing and able to serve him both now and for eternity. Let's pray. Lord, don't let us miss you this Christmas season. Help us to simplify our activities and traditions so we can focus on our celebration of your birth. Thank you for being the Prince of Peace. And I ask for that supernatural peace to reign in our hearts. Thank you for the simple but life-changing message of your love for us. Thank you, God, for sending your Son to be born a virgin to live a perfect life, and to die on the cross for my sins. Thank you that he rose from the dead three days later, and that this Christmas, and every Christmas, we can celebrate the gift of eternal life through Jesus Christ. In Jesus' name, amen.